In 2025, AMD's only competition for modern value CPUs is from AMD. Looking at the latest releases from Team Red, the Ryzen 7 9700X looks like the best all-round option for productivity and gaming. If you ignore the Ryzen 7 7700, which fits the same motherboards, is only a couple of points lower clocked, and is barely above the cost of a current Ryzen 5. But how good is it? This video was sponsored by AliExpress, where you can pick up brand new Ryzen AM5 CPUs, minus their original packaging and stock coolers, for a hefty discount. The Ryzen 7 7700 featured in this video was just over £160 at the time of recording, and you can get great deals on other recent chips like my personal favourite, the Ryzen 5 7500F, and the 7800X 3D that my girl told me not to worry about. What's more, UK viewers can use my discount codes to get even more money off, meaning this 8-core, 16-thread, 5.3GHz beast could be yours for about £140. Not cheap enough? Okay, well, can't win them all, I guess. But what if I offer you cash back? That's right, scan the QR code on screen or search Iceberg in the AliExpress app to join my team and get at least 5% and potentially up to 10% cash back to put towards your next purchase. A couple of people in my comments turned their noses up at the Ryzen 5 7500F I use in my moderately priced gaming PC for testing older and mid-range graphics cards. I've been pretty vocal in my support for the 6-core, 12-thread CPUs, especially for gamers on a budget who want to channel more money towards their GPU or other important things. And pretty much any modern CPU can support some quite high-end graphics cards. That being said, it's not like there's no benefit to having a better CPU, and the price gap between a 100 quid 7500F and a 300 quid 7800X 3D is too much for a lot of people. The 7700 fills that gap nicely, offering a boost clock of up to 5.3GHz, and which can go even higher. As well as making sure my 32GB of DDR5 6000 RAM was tuned to the lazy Hynix timings created by Buildzoid, I also enabled PBO and Curve Optimizer in the BIOS. This means the CPU can boost by an extra 200MHz when needed, and I also dropped the voltage offset by negative 20 to help it achieve that boost frequency more often. I'll link Optimum's video on the subject in the description if you want to know more, as well as Buildzoit's Patreon post containing the memory timings. I'm calling the Ryzen 7 7700 with an overkill 360mm AIO from Thermalrite, but uh, honestly you can get away with using a 240mm or even a dual tower cooler from Thermalrite or Deepcool or ID Cooling or whoever. My motherboard is a B650E from Asus and the power supply is a 1200W Corsair HX series. My GPU of choice is, as usual, the Radeon RX 7900 XT. In my Ryzen 7 7800X 3D video, I found that the old RDNA 3 card could actually be the limiting factor, even with FSR cranked up to performance. And I don't really have a better GPU than this. However, without giving too much away, this time there really were only a couple of instances whereby a faster GPU would have achieved a higher number. Let's start with CS2 because I was clicking heads like nobody's business with this setup. I only came second, but still, this was a pretty decent performance by my standards. Suck it, random gaming in HD. Benchmarking live games like this is never as uniform and consistent as a pre-made benchmark, but they don't put the same kind of load on the CPU as a real game does, so I prefer my way of doing things even if it's not quite as accurate. I saw an average of 320 FPS with lows of 140. I've seen some X3D chips hit 370 and even 390 FPS in a Dust 2 deathmatch, but 80% of the performance for about 50% of the price is nothing to complain about. Likewise, I found that the Cyberpunk synthetic benchmark doesn't really stress the CPU like a drive through the heart of Night City, so I do this the manual way. 
the first test is at Ultra with FSR performance, because Ultra performance isn't an option in FSR 3 for some reason, and while there are a couple of GPU limited moments, notably crossing the bridge from Watson to the city centre, for the most part the CPU is still the component being benchmarked. At 98 FPS on average, we're only 10 frames or so above a 6 core like the 7500F or even the 8400F, and a whopping 20 frames short of the X3D. At RT Ultra, the gap between the 7700 and those lower end parts grows to 15 frames, with the 8 core still holding 91 FPS at these settings, while the 7800X3D is now limited to 100 FPS, most likely by the GPU. I don't have a lot of comparative data for The Last of Us Part 2, as it's fairly new to my roster and has finally replaced Part 1 for me. For a console port, these games can have remarkably high CPU utilisation, but it's nothing the 7700 can't handle. I saw an average of 145 FPS, only a couple of frames short of the 7800X3D, and close even in terms of frame pacing. Spider-Man 2 is a mess of a port, and no combination of CPU and GPU I've ever tested can fix that. Still, with a powerful enough setup, you can at least use a cap to flatten the frame times while swinging through the city, and the 7700 is about as good as you can ask for. Without RT, it can manage an average of 117, with 1% lows of around 80 and 0.1s of around 70, so a 60fps cap should be perfectly smooth. That being said, these numbers are only about 10% above the 7500F, so perhaps not all that compelling. With RT enabled, the average drops to the 70s and lows are in the 40s, and these figures are still only 10% better than a 6 core, and only 1 or 2 frames behind the 7800X3D. Sorry enthusiasts, but uh, sometimes there's no hardware solution to a problem caused by software. Sometimes you wonder why a game is demanding on CPUs, but not so in the case of Warhammer Space Marine 2. The hundreds of enemies on screen at any one time can contribute to a serious CPU bottleneck if you're not properly equipped, and the 7700 definitely counts. It can handle 118 FPS on average, about 20% higher than a modern Ryzen 5, and over 40% faster than the Ryzen 7 5700 from the last generation. Yes, the 7800X3D can push close to 140 FPS, and if you have a high refresh monitor you can even get to appreciate that, but this is still a healthy improvement. Hitman World of Assassination, or as it's written in the script, Hitman Whoa. can still be very heavy on physics simulation. I've seen this game bring systems to their knees with even this same RX 7900 XT installed, so this is one of those instances where your choice of processor can affect gameplay even if you're not chasing some high frame rates. But not this time. You're free to push Hitman all the way up to 185 FPS without ray tracing, which is a solid 30% improvement over the 6 core chips, but still 25% below the X3D. Interestingly, well, interesting to me, with RT enabled, the 114 FPS average is dead level with the 7800X3D. This could be a GPU limit, but I noticed a similar thing comparing the old Ryzen 5700 with its 3D counterpart, so for some reason it seems like this game likes more cache in rasterized rendering, but not in ray tracing. Does that matter? Not in the slightest, but it is a bit weird. Starfield DLC talk has been doing the rounds again lately, and I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't a few critical re-evaluations now that we've all gotten over the early footage of terrifying NPCs and Bethesda bugs galore. It's still ridiculously demanding for what it actually offers players, and the parts of the game that don't require a hefty CPU are the barren open wastes that make you wonder why you bother playing. Anyway, here in New Atlantis, the 7700 can deliver about 115 FPS on average, but we are GPU limited. I didn't bother testing the 7800X3D in this game, but the 7945HX3D reaches a similar frame rate, and the 7500F is only 20 frames behind this. 
Finally, Baldur's Gate 3 is notoriously a fan of X3D chips, and in fact the amount of L3 cache is one of the key factors on performance in this one. You might say that uh, cache rules everything around me. The Ryzen 7 7700 can manage 135 FPS, a distant 33% behind the 7800X3D and only 20% above the 7500F, which is still running through the city at 112 FPS. If I'm honest, most of the gaming results aren't enough for me to recommend the 7700 over the 7500F or 7600, especially if you're looking to pair it with anything less than a top 5 GPU. Of course, gaming isn't everything, and if you're like me, your gaming rig is also your workstation, and perhaps you need 8 cores for more than just clicking heads. In Cinebench, the 7700 slaps the 7800X3D around in both single and multi-core testing, thanks to its 5.5GHz boost frequency. It's also 26% ahead of the previous generation Ryzen 7 5700. In Geekbench 6 it's a similar story, though the lead over the old AM4 chip extends to almost 50% in single core and 65% in multi-core. Also, I don't have a chart for this as it's the first CPU I've tested, but the new Geekbench AI test results are on screen now. This generation of Ryzen has no NPU, so it remains to be seen how it compares to newer models in this regard, but on the positive side, that might help keep the price down. If I were to recommend a budget CPU for gamers to pair with an RX 9070 or RTX 5070, then my opinion remains unchanged. Get the 7500F, or the 7600 if you want the integrated graphics. The 7700 is measurably better in many benchmarks, but probably not noticeably so, especially if you're not trying to eke out the maximum possible FPS. The best reason to upgrade to the 7700 is if you do more than just gaming and web browsing, and it doesn't hurt that the price difference can be as little as £50. Don't forget to check out AliExpress to get any of these CPUs for a great price. UK viewers can use the codes on screen for almost anything you like on the site, and join the Iceberg Tech team to start claiming cashback credit for future purchases. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.